Uh, I'm happy that we are continue to talk about the use of data uh, in education. I have very nice, extinguished guests today, and they come with lots of new information and very important news to share with you. So let me just present my guests for the beginning. So I'm starting on my left side. Welcome, Juliette Norman-Smith. from digital dig She is Digital Technology Specialist in Division of Education Policies and Lifelong Learning System from UNESCO. She has international experience in education policy and practices. Her work at UNESCO and the University of Oxford focuses on the nexus of digital technology, inclusion and education focusing on digital transformation policy within UNESCO and coordinating the Data for Learning Working Group of the Broadband Commission, Juliet strives to deepen the understanding of how we can harness the potential of data to drive the safe, inclusive and equitable transformation of education. Juliet's work in education policy is also informed by her years as a teacher for students with special needs. Welcome, Juliet. Thank you. Next to her is Stefan Vincent Lacrim. Senior Analyst at the OECD Center for Education, Research and Innovation. Stefan leads work on digitalization in education like smart data and digital technology in education, AI, learning analytics and beyond, education during COVID-19 crisis, as well as large education practices engage innovation like fostering and assessing creativity and critical thinking in education. His work has focused on innovation in education, looking at how to support innovation-friendly ecosystems in education, how to drive change and adapt to education. Welcome, Stephen. We continue with Professor Sonia Livingstone from London School of Economics and Political Sciences, Digital Futures Commission. Sonia is a professor of social psychology who published many books, including Parenting for a Digital Future, How Hopes and Fears About Technology Shape Children's Lives. She directs the Digital Futures Commission and Global Kids Online and works on a series of European Commission funded projects concerned with children's opportunities, risks and rights in digital world. For example, like EU Kids Online Network, in which Sonia has advised the UK government, EU, Europe and international institutions on children's internet safety and rights in the digital environment. Welcome, Sonia. And last but not least, Maria Guduma from European Commission, DGR, Unit for Digital Education. She has been working on the design and implementation of the digital action uh, education Action Plan 21-27, leading action on emerging technologies, including AI and data in education. She's also a cybersecurity ambassador for DGAC and in the past has worked on digital transformation strategy of in institutions. Before joining the commission, Maria had been working in Greek Ministry of Education as an educational expert and a teacher, and she was awarded many scholarships and funding for her academic and professional performance in ADS. Welcome, Maria. So, some of the publication my guests have been working were published very, very recently, some of them just last week, so please pay attention <laughs> to those very important, fresh news just for your ears and eyes. So we will start as we are sitting. This is important for our tech people. <laughs> so Juliette, let me ask you. So UNESCO Broad Commission, Working Group on Data for Learning, in their interim report talks about transformative potential of data and the necessity to unleash that potential. So how and why? Please tell us. Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, it's an honor to be here today and to be part of this discussion, which is a critical one to have and to keep having, given the dizzying pace of change in the education data landscape. So this is, of course, the European SchoolNet conference, but what I hope to bring today is a bit of UNESCO's global policy lens for comparison. We'll do this in two parts. Uh, first, some broad brushstrokes of the work that UNESCO is doing in this area, and second, we'll dive more deeply into UNESCO's work with the Broadband Commission uh, for Sustainable Development and its working group on data for learning. So first, what is UNESCO doing in this space of data ethics and efficiency? UNESCO has taken a leading role in mobilizing the international community to work towards the development of an international framework for upholding the rule of law in the digital world. 
A big step was taken with the adoption of the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence in 2019, which was the very first international standard setting instrument on the subject. Today, actually over 71% of countries worldwide have adopted laws concerning uh, personal data protection, and a lot of them are modeled after the GDPR, which is seen as kind of the gold standard in this area, um, thanks to the many advances of European stakeholders. However, data regulations are not always specific to educational contexts nor to children. So to move international work forward on how these normative instruments apply to education specifically, UNESCO launched the Evolving Dimensions of the Right to Education initiative, which examines new challenges and trends facing the right to education, including in the digital sphere. Despite this recent progress, there's much more work to be done to embed data ethics into law. But how do we make sure that these expanding regulations um, don't stifle innovation? We need innovation and investment in education right now because we're in a global learning crisis, which was made very clear at the UN's Transforming Education Summit in September. There are 700 million illiterate adults. 70% of children in lower income countries are unable to read a basic text by age 10. We have 244 million young people out of school. And it's actually data like these that can tell a powerful story, that can mobilize financial, political, social investments in transforming education. So on the one hand, uh, we need data-informed improvements, but on the other, we can't let this use of these data encroach on our human rights. So this brings me to the work that UNESCO is doing with the Broadband Commission on Education Data. Briefly for a bit of background, the Broadband Commission was established by UNESCO and the ITU in 2010, and it has been advocating for universal broadband connectivity ever since. The Commission calls together multi-stakeholder working groups each year, and currently UNESCO is chairing the working group on data for learning, and Sonia and Stefan are, are members of this group and have been really valu valuable contributors to answering the group's guiding question, which uh, Lydia referenced earlier, which is how can we harness the potential of data to drive the safe, inclusive, and equitable transformation of education. So the main narrative of this interim report argues that data for learning is a double-edged sword. It's not inherently good nor bad. On the one hand, it can be wielded to plan smarter, to help teachers, to personalize learning journeys. But on the other hand, it can undermine personal privacy and can be exploited for commercial gain, which our keynote speakers uh, really brought that point home this morning. So what the report tries to offer is a global perspective on these benefits and risks and how to strike the right balance between them. Today, many countries outside of Europe don't have the capacities or the infrastructure uh, needed to leverage the benefits of data for learning. So to help bridge these data divides and support education transformation, the interim report recommends five things. A whole of government vision and strategy to ensure safe and secure data system interoperability, sustainable and equitable financing of education data, data literacy development at all levels of education stakeholders to support democratic societies where evidence is distinguished from opinion, purposeful data use that targets systemic ob obstacles to educational equity, and multi-stakeholder and multilateral cooperation for democratized education data and data ethics standards. So these recommendations may sound broad and rather far from sort of on the ground action, but policies do make a really big difference. They can incentivize, they can regulate, they can support positive, equitable digital transformation. But they also need to be globally conscious because expanding regulation in Europe and in North America can have inadvertent international ripple effects. And so we need to encourage movements for data literacy and ownership in areas with newer digital infrastructures. Because globally, we've agreed that all children have the right to autonomy, children have the right to be heard, they have the right not to suffer from discrimination, and yes, of course, they have the right to education. And international institutions around the world are waking up, taking notice, and taking cooperative action together to ensure that data directly benefits teachers and learners of all ages and does not conflict with our human rights. Thank you, Thank you Juliet. I'm surprised we did such a big numbers, but UNESCO different has a global perspective. And we continue from UNESCO to OECD. Just heard another part of the global perspective. So uh, OECD Digital Education Outlooks talk about education technology implementation, how to use technology uh, 
to support equity and effectiveness. So what OECD could recommend to us and to guide us somewhere? Please, uh, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's really my pleasure to be here. And perhaps, you know, as a kind of uh, overarching remark, I would say I'm reading here transforming education in Europe, and I do believe that, in fact, you know, digital digitalization is one of the elements if you want to do that, and probably that it needs to be, a, uh, you know, a transformation of schooling and not just, you know, the integration of digital tools in the current model that we currently have. So we published... a. Uh, um, in 2021, the first OECD Digital Education Outlook 2021, which looked at the frontiers of technology, so what actually the current technologies, AI, etc., allow us to do, and that, as we could see during the pandemic, we didn't really use, you know, and we don't have available in many cases, uh, and we're currently working on what countries have, and thanks to some of you in the audience, you know, what uh, uh, countries offer in terms of digital infrastructure for learning and, and teaching in different countries and also how uh, you know all these data and digital technologies are regulated within within countries let me take two examples on you know what the potential of you know digitalization and the smart use of data could could give us i think one of the very uh, positive aspects is that in Europe, at least, you know, most countries currently have a student information system or an EMIS, an education and management information system, as, you know, it's called more globally. Uh, and that's really something that has actually changed the way that we, as, you know, policymakers can intervene, you know, in, in, in different countries. One example is actually, and here that links to the use of, you know, the advance of smart technologies is uh, the use of early warning system. Um, so, you know, one of the problems in most countries is uh, high school dropout or dropout later on, but let me stay with high school dropout. And one of the things that is these early warning systems using the student information systems do is actually to try to diagnose and predict, you know, whether students are at risk of dropping out. They do it with different levels of uh, uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and Dr. Monique was pretty right. Some of them do it with a 50% you know, chance, and that I can do myself, you know, that's part of... Uh, uh, some of them do it with much higher levels of, of accuracy. And, but perhaps what's, you know, the most important thing that uh, they do is to make us change our thinking about how our education systems work. What they allow us to do, for example, is to identify that, you know, what we have in mind at school dropouts, students who don't like school, who have uh, low grades and declining grades, are part of you know, these students, but they only represent 40% of those students in the United States. And you have you know, about 60%, not 60, 50% uh, 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 who actually uh, are the, what colleagues have called the quiet dropouts. You know? So there are students who do like school, go to school, have also low grades, but uh, increasing grades, you know, so that it's not a disparate situation. Only problem is that they don't increase uh, fast enough. And then you have 10% of engaged dropout. So 10% that I would say, you know, human beings could identify, but they haven't. You know, 10% of people who are strong at school, who like school, but unfortunately for them, for whatever reason, usually for an administrative reason, they don't have enough credits in the US system to get the high school degree. And so they don't feel like doing it once more and they drop out of high school without a degree. And so here you can see that, well, you know, that there are some categories of students that, thanks to technology and thanks to data, we can actually identify and de 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 design new interventions. Here, and when we talk about the smart and responsible use of data, we have to keep in mind that the technology doesn't do the intervention. It's human beings who have to do it afterwards, and they have to do it in a smart, responsible, and ethical way, you know, because there are a lot of interventions and we can talk about it later. Let me give a second example, which are, we know, we've talked about personalization as an example of positive interventions, and probably intelligent tutoring systems are, you know, one of the low-hanging fruit in this area, and the one that is actually used uh, uh, in a more widespread way. And we have a few interventions, like assessment in the United States, we know, which have been evaluated through uh, an experimental design and showed that they do actually improve uh, when they're used as uh, a home tutoring 
and give feedback to teachers. They improve the results of students, and they narrow the achievement gap between those with a prior achievement, which is low, and the, one, the other ones, which are average. So here, we have a, you know, a technology tool based on AI that actually achieves one of the things that we say we want to achieve, you know, with narrowing the achievement gap and improving equity. We have two examples, two different ones, because we know we're talking about data. Data is anything today, you know, so I'm a data to you right now. Uh, but um, we have, you know, the two important ones are, in my view, administrative data, the one that are collected in the process of schooling, and a second type for intelligent tutoring system that's not exactly the same category, you know. These, these are not held by governments or by, you know, ministries or schools, public schools, etc., but usually by companies indeed. And so it's not exactly the same type of challenges that we have for these two types of, of data. So now I'm going to finish, but we're in Europe. And so that's always interesting to me to be in European conferences, you know, because everyone is complaining it's very dangerous, <laughs> it's very risky, you know. And at the same time, in many cases, you know, uh, there is one of the challenges for that is to regulate and to regulate in such a way that it doesn't prevent the positive things to happen. Uh, and, you know, so it shouldn't over-regulate. One shouldn't over-interpret the regulation so that we, at the end, do nothing. And we end up, as Europeans, using, you know, the US or Chinese solution that are over there and which we don't like to use. And I say we. <laughs> Uh, here as a European myself, you know, not an OECD officer, obviously. <laughs> so that's my... Thank you, Stefan, for putting Europe <laughs> on the world map again. <laughs> <laughs> so we heard about several gaps already, achievement gap, digital skills gap, but I will now invite Sonia to address another gap. The gap between claims for educational benefits and the risks about processing, collecting and monetizing children's intimate data. So, what are the challenges and risks for school education and children data? Sonia, please. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, it's a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to um, talk today about something I've been working on uh, for some years now in a very kind of focused um, way. Uh, so just a word about the Digital Futures Commission, which is um, a, a research, applied research project set up with the Five Rights Foundation and the LSE. We, we began uh, to try to understand um, what good looks like for children in a digital world, and we decided to focus on ed, ed tech and education data as one of our work strands. Um, because it seems somehow under the radar, somehow um, outside this room, at least um, uh, not too many people paying, paying attention to it. But having asked what good looks like, I have to say we've been through a bit of a, a journey with all the problems, and um, I will try to get to um, a positive place. But um, I, I, to my mind, one of the starting points that hasn't um, that we should pay more attention to is the way in which um, our public schools are increasingly relying on a commercial uh, infrastructure uh, as provided through EdTech for learning, teaching, assessment, administration, and safeguarding. And that shift from um, to do public education through a privately owned infrastructure, I think, is not getting enough um, critical scrutiny. So what we know about schools, of course, is that children are generally not asked. Indeed, it would be impractical in a way in a, in a school to ask children, do you want to consent to this or that? Do you want to use this or that? The, the school needs to be able to say, this is, this is the technology that we will use in the classroom and to have the children use it. Um, and yet that, that combination of commercial infrastructure and children receiving very little choice about what um, technology they use, what data is taken from them, what data is inferred about them, um, and very little opportunity um, for correction or remedy um, of that data. So I think we are all um, aware, and um, Professor Seebach uh, mentioned uh, instances of data leakage, hacking, misuse. I'm sorry that Britain is often um, a great example, but recently um, it seems we let our national database on school pupils be used by a gambling company who wanted uh, to do age verification. I mean, just so. <laughs> 
Um, so um, I, I wanted to make a few a few points. I think in in this context, it is very difficult to know where the data collected um, through children at school. It's very difficult to know where that data goes. So we can just about discover the third parties that companies share with, but it's very hard to know which data goes to which third parties and then when it go where it goes further in the commercial data ecology. And in our work, we've done a, a socio-legal analysis which finds that the data are <laughs> is um, better governed when de-identified and processed for public policy purposes and worse governed when processed as identifiable data processed by commercial ed tech. And we have this kind of paradox of public bodies within education and beyond feeling impeded by GDPR and not able to use data in children's best interests, or so they believe, while we have commercial businesses using children's data more or less freely for R&D, for research and development on products during um, their learning lives. And we just do not know what is happening to this data in the future and where it will go, how it will affect children's life chances. I'm intrigued that um, different European countries are taking a different approach. So we um, wrote a report recently on Google um, Classroom or Google um, Workspace for Education, and we can see legal challenges to its data processing in the Netherlands, in Germany, in um, Denmark, but not in other countries. And in Britain, just to again um, give the example I know best, we have a kind of David and Goliath problem where the Ministry for Education says each of our 30,000 schools must individually negotiate, conduct its own data protection impact assessment, individually negotiate with Google or Microsoft or whichever kind of monolith with very little guidance from the center. And this is putting schools in the invidious position of trying to spend scarce resources on the kind of expertise that is hard to come by to kind of navigate what is right for children. Um, so we, you know, there, there are many ways in which the, the GDPR, um, which has many strengths, is not being effectively implemented. So we see a lot of struggle. We did um, interviews with teachers, school um, data protection officers and so forth to understand what they faced and you know it's not a high priority always in schools and it's a real a real challenge for schools so data minimization purpose limitation children's data subject rights are are routinely flouted um, in schools i think not due to the fault of the schools but due to ineffective regulation or implementation and not sufficient guidance um, from the data from the um, ministries of education Thank you, Sonia. And um, you actually made the perfect lead for Maria at the end, <laughs> mentioning several times guidelines from a central point. So, uh, Maria, we know that the European Commission recently published ethical guidelines on the use of AI uh, and data in education. So, what are uh, intention of those guidelines and how are we going to see it in use? Please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I think it's my time after the international examples to take uh, the context a little bit, uh, to, to narrow it down to the European Union aspect. So, as you all know, we probably, probably know, the European Commission has set a vision and a goal to have a digital transformation, a digital transition uh, of the European Union by 2030. This actually means that we will have to advance digitally, not only in research and innovation, but also in our everyday lives. How we use digital education tools and resources in every aspect of our activities. Of course, this includes also education. The problem is that education is a little bit more challenging because it has to do with children, as Sonia rightfully mentioned. So this is a little bit more sensitive and, uh, and also more demanding. In that sense, we developed a digital education action plan back in 2018. This digital education action plan included some actions that would help schools and education stakeholders catch up with digital advances all over the globe. After two or three years, more or less, we noticed that this first initial plan was very successful. People were demanding for more actions, were expecting more funding from us, more initiatives and more policies. Of course, with funding and policies also came some regulations and some legal frameworks 
which in some occasions might uh, be a little restrictive, as uh, Stefan also mentioned. But of course, we cannot have something innovative without legal and ethical implications following. So following the success of the first Digital Education Action Plan, we developed a second Digital Education Action Plan, which is much more ambition, ambitious. It includes more actions, and it's actually wider in time. It spreads between 2021 and 2027. I think that uh, many of you might probably know some of the actions in the Digital Education Action Plan. Some of them are very popular, like Code Week or the hackathons, or the funding we provide to connect, uh, to provide internet connections at schools and so on. Apart from these actions, we also have developed the Digital Education Competencies Framework. It's a general competencies framework for citizens, but we also narrow it down a little bit to educators. Following this uh, dig comp, as we say, we also started exploring emerging technologies in education. Among them, we explored blockchain, digital wallets, interoperability, but also, of course, we started exploring artificial intelligence and data using education. Some people have actually criticized us a little bit, saying that AI is not yet at schools. It is true that we have not asked its educator across the European Union and its school across the European Union if they are using, it, if they are intend to use AI at schools. But still, even if AI is not widely popular in the European Union today, we need to start framing it and guiding educators and students on how to use it at schools. We cannot just refrain from using it or avoid talking about education, AI in education at all. This is the reason why we started developing the first ever ethical guidelines on the use of AI and data in teaching and learning for educators. Of course, we didn't do this out of the blue. We had a group of experts. I can see that many of you are actually members of this expert group and helped us uh, develop these guidelines. So we used a group of experts. We consulted with ministries of education across the European Union. We consulted with teachers. We had workshops dedicated for primary and secondary education teachers. And we also asked e-twinning uh, schools. We discussed with commission services. And we collaborated with UNESCO and OECD on developing the guidelines. These guidelines are the first of their kind in the European Union. This means that they might have some shortcomings, but they are also quite innovative. They are a first, and they are opening a way, let's say, to schools to start reflecting a little bit on how to use AI at schools. The first thing we thought that we should include in these guidelines are proper definitions of what we actually mean when we talk about data usage and about AI in education. So we started with defining what these things are, what this concept is. It's something tangible. How do we use it at school? And then we started exploring, exploring use cases. Examples. We asked teachers across the European Union, how do you use AI and data in schools? How do you collect them? How do you analyze them? How do you report on data in schools? They gave us examples, and out of these examples, we developed four categories of using AI and data in schools. The four categories, more or less, include student learning, use, teaching, use, supporting teachers in their work, and of course, supporting the administrative systems that are backing up the entire education process. So we identified use cases in all these four categories. And then, of course, we started asking questions. How can we help teachers or educational stakeholders, principals, ministries, to select the appropriate tools, as mentioned my, by my predecessors as well? So we developed a set of guiding questions for teachers that they should ask and self-reflect on this questions in order to select not only the best and most appropriate AI and data tools in educational settings, but also how to use them. For us, there is no point to, to use a tool unless this tool has a specific use in education and for education and is purposeful. As other people already mentioned in their um, talks, there is no use in collecting useless data. Why do you really care if a child comes from a specific background if this is not going to be used to have a logical deduction 
or a conclusion that can somehow be used to take further steps and address specific challenges. So we developed concrete questions that the teachers can self-reflect on, and upon this self-reflection, we also supplement the questions with some competencies that we feel the teachers will need to have in the future. We realized that we have a digital competencies framework that was updated in March 2022. But you know very well that education and education technology evolve rapidly. We are always in a constant chase of new technological advances, <coughs> new tools that are doing something we had not foreseen in the past. So it's a little bit like a race. That's why we try to foresee emerging competencies that the teachers will need in the imminent future. So we developed a set of competencies, some of are already mentioned, including, for example, justified choice, human agency, competencies related to fairness, to transparency, not only privacy and GDPR. We are not talking about GDPR only. Take, for example, human agency. How do you use the tool? How do you select it? What is going to happen with that tool? Or justified choice. Everyone has a responsibility. Everyone is taking a choice. So this is a competence, a critical thinking competence we need to develop in the future. So the guidelines also include some sort of emerging competences. And of course, our overall goal is to raise awareness on the use of AI and data in schools, go to all schools, all educat education stakeholders, and open a dialogue with them on how we should select and use all of these tools properly. And when I'm talking about education ex stakeholders, I'm not only talking about teachers. We will try to engage students, we will try to engage parents, we will also try to engage the private sector and the ed tech, because we realize that this is a system. We are all connected in this, and we need to approach it in that manner. It's everything is connected, so everyone needs to enter this discussion. So these are the guidelines. I invite all of you to have a look. Uh, they are already translated in all EU languages, and they are available in the publications office. Uh, thank you, Maria. You actually stole my last line. I wanted to tell you that uh, guidelines are published on a Friday on all European Union languages. So please, you have no excuse for not reading it. <laughs> have that in mind. Uh, from all of my panelists, we heard some ideas about purposeful, meaningful, efficient use of data. But for the next question, I try to ask and focus your answers on the positive examples of the data use. Julieta, would you be kind to start? Thank you, Lydia. Um, I think to answer this question, we have to step back first and ask what do we mean by education data? What kind of education data are we talking about? Because obviously it can be uh, big, it can be small, it can be qualitative, it can be quantitative. Um, it can be digital, obviously, but it can also be paper-based and uh, derived from radio and, and television interventions. Um, and it's used in, in teaching and learning, but it's also used in planning, administration, and, and management. And these are all really important parts of education system processes as well. And UNESCO does a lot of work in this area of uh, management information systems and actually has a community of practice on it. Um, so depending on what type of data and what type of data use we're talking about, you're going to have very different answers to what makes that use positive and smart and responsible. So for example, if we look at it from the planning and management perspective, education system planning without data is like flying blind. You need to see a problem to be able to address it and to mitigate it and to find a solution. But actually, in many low and, and middle income countries, even foundational learning data aren't collected frequently or uh, sometimes not even collected at all. So this means that policymakers don't know where to direct their resources if, or if curriculum decisions are effective or not. Um, so we can agree that education data is, is important, but then what could some examples of that smart use look like? So again, uh, to give a concrete example, an interesting one comes from Sierra Leone. Uh, recently, they converted their annual school census form into an agile open data kit format, and they're using solar-powered tablets to help the accurate collection of enrollment and infrastructure data. And then they use this data to inform, purposefully, financial allocations to the most marginalized school districts. 
from the big data for learning perspective, uh, countries like the UAE and Republic of Korea and many European countries are aggregating administrative data with learning process data to unveil nuances about perhaps uh, systemic inequalities and then target programs to, for example, students with special needs. Um, so this smart, smart and positive and responsible use would be, and it's been said before today already, to collect only what's necessary for a specific purpose. It shouldn't be used by third parties to provide business intelligence without a learner's permission. Um, and tools like predictive analytics should not determine decisions, but rather inform them. Uh, because we know that data sets and dashboards are, are human-generated tools, not unbiased absolute truths. So finally, from the smaller local data perspective, which I find really interesting, the answer changes again. So one example that we cite in the interim report from BBCom is a Microsoft Research India project uh, to help visually impaired children develop foundational numeracy and computational skills. Uh, the team collected detailed observations and longitudinal qualitative data from classrooms and then made accessible educational products that were targeted to supporting the most marginalized learners in that context. So as a whole, if collected for a specific purpose, if socially contextualized, and if teachers feel empowered to use this data as a tool in their pedagogical toolbox, then that's when we can see positive, real, smart impacts. We will follow your guidelines, definitely. <laughs> Stefan, <laughs> what OECD have to add to this? I, I think that um, um, if we go back to this idea of um, you know, usefulness and you know, effectiveness, so I think that, you know, um, uh, a smart use is, of course, to do that. And one way to summarize it would be uh, to use data in such a way that it makes us or teachers see things that they couldn't see otherwise. You know, so that uh, that make something visible that you, you you couldn't do before. And let me take one example of that, um, and on something which is a pretty creepy in other ways, uh, uses of smart data, which are just experimental, so don't be frightened, you know. Uh, in terms of classroom analytics, for example, you know, it's a way you have sensors in the room that will, for example, tell a teacher uh, where she has, how she's been using the space. Uh, and, you know, one example of that sometimes is that, you know, you spend a lot of time at your desk, or, and sometimes you just spend time with uh, one part of the classroom. And I think that's interesting because usually you don't know that, you know, or how long you're talking, etc. And it just provides you feedback as a teacher on how I can actually improve things. And in fact, while I'm teaching, I cannot see it, you know, what, what, what I'm doing. So I get individual feedback on that. Uh, now, if we think of responsible use, we know we've talked a lot about regulation, etc. We're going to talk about it more. Uh, I would like to emphasize, you know, the importance of uh, uh, doing things which are equitable and fair, you know, and that actually using the technology for that as well. And a positive example of that is actually technology, AI technology that we have in our phone, you know, uh, how speech to text or text to speech can actually make, you know, regular classroom more accessible to visually impaired students. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that's, so that's an example of that, which also means that we, ha we have to think about affordability and cost, you know, when we because we're talking about AI, the big problem of all this question is that it's expensive, you know? And so the big question is how, if we want to use these kind of tools as part of the classroom, um, you know, they have to become much more affordable. Hmm. Sonia, is the question complicated? Or do you have a well, line which um, says something <laughs> positive? <laughs> Um, so, so at the Digital Futures Commission, we actually held a round table with all the experts we could, uh, with lots of experts that we we wanted to um, consult, including um, teachers, head teachers, and um, school governors, um, and so forth, on on what were the benefits. And I have to say, from consulting them, uh, we were not overwhelmed with positive use cases. And they, I, I was interested that in a way they were among the most, or one of the skeptical communities, perhaps because they do feel a bit disempowered with the technology coming into the classroom. So their questions were things like, compared with what? 
Um, I mean, I might say, if, if Stefan will forgive me, if um, any child in that class could have told you that the teacher is spending too long at the desk and not, not being around. I mean, there are, there are other, perhaps less data-intensive ways of getting some of that information. But the other thing that, people, that, that schools asked us was, you know, who says? I mean, by what process do we know what works? So, um, and, and do we have a... Do we have do we have an agreed way of you know independent review um, evaluation of of how edtech works in a particular instance by comparison with others, and I and I think perhaps my 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 last point, um, Lydia, if I can trespass on your your kindness, is 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 just to say we need to disaggregate different kinds of of edtech. So I think in the academic literature there is a fair bit of evidence that rote learning apps, just kind of practicing your French verbs as I should have done a lot more in school, <laughs> um, or um, practicing the maths problems that you find difficult, those are helpful. And students can be asked to do them in their own time. Um, uh, as Stefan mentioned, um, technology that improves accessibility for children with disabilities, this is, this is um, also helpful. Um, for or teachers to identify which children are falling behind, perhaps. Actually, they always had ways of keeping track of those kids, but maybe. Um, but not for not for all the other things that are promised. And it is that promise of, you know, so not for creativity yet, not for deep learning yet, not for integrative or collaborative um, thinking yet, not actually the, the experts in personalized learning are unimpressed with what is currently on offer for mm -hmm. personalized learning, that this is a very popular use case. And, and rote learning apps and so forth, they don't need intensive data collection. Mm -hmm. So the ones that we have the good use cases for don't require all that sensitive data being hoovered up through the school day. So I think a little skepticism is <laughs> still in order. But I see both of us uh, practicing math in uh, French next time. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that fingers really crossed for that. <laughs> Maria, what do European Commission have as a positive use of data in mind? Well, there are, there are always two aspects, I would say, a positive and a more skeptical one. So I think we, we have both. I will start by mentioning something that we always take for granted, but we should really take it for granted. Educational data are data collected in education for education. Mm. They shouldn't expand to other fields or provided and shared in other uh, domains, like for example, uh, um, US-based uh, companies mm -hmm. or uh, social security and pension schemes and companies and so on. In education, for education. Mm -hmm. That's the first uh, mm -hmm. thing that we support very strongly. Then we need to discuss a little bit about how we collect, what we collect, as Sonia mentioned, how we analyze data, and then how we report back on them. It, it's a little bit like the three steps that we take when we write a, an academic paper or a thesis, but we shouldn't take it for granted as well. Do you collect what is really necessary and essential? Do you analyze it in an ethical and legal manner? Do you then report it in a way that is going to be useful for the people that are going to receive this report? And I'm talking about reporting, of course, not only in the educational context, but in terms of the European Commission, I have to mention that this reporting is also helpful to us because these insights help us uh, develop new policies or uh, design new initiatives. So, as you can understand, the European Commission actually needs the data that come from schools. But again, we use it for education and not for any other purpose. So, I would definitely say that for us, useful, smart data and responsible data are data that are collected in a legal and ethical framework in a manner that has a purpose, a meaning, and does not inflict any sort of uh, pain or danger to anyone. Let me continue with that, Maria. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in ethical guidelines, there was also part about teacher competences, you already mentioned it. So, uh, what competences are needed from teachers to use data smart, efficiently, purposefully? And uh, what trainings do teachers need? How are we going to support them to develop such a competences? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's a very interesting question always for me. <laughs> As I, I used to come decades ago from a, from a teaching background. So quite often I discuss with my colleagues in the commission that we expect too much from uh, teachers. We want them to be pedagogically sound. We want them to have uh, subject-specific knowledge. We want them to be psychologists, uh, animateurs, uh, tourist guides. Uh, we want them to do everything. This is a lot of pressure. So we really need to understand that they are not our dolls or our puppets, and we can just ask something, then th and they will do it. We need to work with these people, really listen to these people, and develop a competencies framework that will take them into account. This is why I have to say that I'm very happy that during this uh, process of um, creating the second version of the digital competencies framework, we had a lot of communities of practice, online communities of practice, that supported uh, and gave a voice to many stakeholders from various topics, various domains and fields. And we are very happy that we have literally thousands of people that provided insights and input on developing a new digital competencies framework. So I think that the first step that we need to do is to support teachers by giving them a framework and a set of self-reflection questions, like selfie for teachers, for example, that they can think on their own time and space about their own practices, their own needs, what they need to develop even further. And working with this competencies framework, along with the ethical guidelines that, as mentioned, they also include some new emerging competencies closely related to data and AI. For example, as I mentioned, human agency, justified choice, and so on. So I think the first step is for s teachers to self-reflect on their own pace on their competencies, and then they can come back to us to receive funding opportunities, mostly through Erasmus Plus or uh, e-twinning projects, so that we can help them attend trainings and have access to online resources, for example, through the, um, th the new recently named uh, the European School Education Platform. It's the former gateway, which includes a lot of online resources, videos, MOOCs, uh, articles on AI and data and how to develop competencies on them. So we try to provide a lot of trainings, a lot of funding opportunities and online material that they can use at their own time to develop even further. And of course, we also need to mention that they need support, uh, technical support. For example, they need funding with their hardware, they need internet connection. So we also have as European Commission programs and initiatives that provide funding for internet and hardware as well, because sometimes we, need to, we tend to forget that as well. So I think it's a holistic approach. Give self-reflection tools, frameworks, and the actual funding and resources to develop. I believe our audience very much paid attention to your financing <laughs> activities. Why not? Of no, feel invited. <laughs> feel free to ask me, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Uh, Sonia, what's in the Britain to support teachers in developing competencies to use data? So, um, so I'd like to make um, two yeah, quick points. Um, one, I think uh, this is a question for teachers, and um, we should consult teachers, and I think teachers I don't know how much they really feel they have a voice in um, shaping the way in which technologies are used in the classroom, but I think we need to know what problems they face and start from from their account of, you know, what, yes, um, an awareness to think about where the data goes and what data is being collected in the, in the typical school day, but also to have a, perhaps a kind of playful and constructive and teacher-led forum to consider what, what could be done with that. And then, because what happens, I think, at the moment is that the data disappears somewhere and then a company sells back to them insights, which the company deems on high will be of value and which teachers are rather skeptical of. And that interaction, that teacher-led process is not there. The, the other thing um, I, I heard from one school, which is stuck in my mind, was an account of two teachers, teachers have no time, as we know, no free time. Two teachers spending their evening, one of them read the data from software package A, while the other entered it into software package B because there was no interoperability. So I think if we want teachers to have time to do any of these things, we have got to design the tech better so we don't waste their time. Totally agree with you. Those techs should work for us, not we working for the techs. Mm. 
Stefan, OECD has a lovely sets of data. <laughs> Do teachers <laughs> can use them? Yeah, so yeah. let me say that first I, I, I agree with what Sonia just, just said on, on that and uh, you know the importance of involving teachers in, in you know the that and I love digital competencies frameworks but somehow I don't like so much this the term digital competencies <laughs> because I believe that it's more about pedagogical competencies, you know, and and that the technology itself if in fact, you know, I need a training to use my phone, then probably it's not well designed and, you know, it's not going to be used and that's, and it deserved it, you know, that's, uh, and so perhaps it's more, for example, you know, uh, how can I use the technology in my phone actually, for example, to develop the creativity of my children. What? So I would disagree with you on what mm -hmm. you said earlier that it's not good for that, you know, so let me give you one example. Uh, I happen to, to like music and, and you know, we do, have done some work on music education and one thing that you can do with your phone, you know, is to use all these digital softwares for music like GarageBand or things that you have, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have in this phone, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and actually it makes the students compose something, mm -hmm. design music, something that you couldn't do before, you know, because then you needed mm -hmm. to have students who can play instruments, who mm -hmm. knew something about music, etc. Mm -hmm. Now you can actually do these projects where they can yep, I agree. imagine, create something, and develop their creativity mm -hmm. uh, in ways that was not possible before. So let's not, s that's a pedagogical mm -hmm. thing. Perhaps you need to understand how GarageBand works if that's the software you want to use, but you know, that's a kind of a secondary thing. So, but student teachers need to be supported, you know, they to have the time, you know, and, and we have to think of how to not waste that time with other things which are much less important than that. Thank you. Juliette, global perspective? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, again, taking the sort of ecosystem approach to, to answer how do we support teacher competences, we have to look beyond teachers. It's, of course, critical to have them involved, but, um, and don't get me wrong, I know that teachers are, are key players. I also was, was a teacher, but above teachers, you have school leaders who are really, really vital in this, in, in supporting their teachers to, to understand data as a pedagogical tool. And then above the school leaders, you have the policymakers who are deciding sort of how integrated or how centralized their education management information system is. So all that to say teachers are really just one uh, one part of a long chain of education decision makers that uh, we need to think of their competencies and, and their literacies and data. Um, it's very difficult for elected officials to be experts in everything, especially in a landscape like education data that is so rapidly evolving. So um, we need to think of it as, as an ongoing competency. It's not just something that you can check off and then never return to. Uh, so instead of thinking about static competence, we, we really need to think about confidence. Do, do teachers think critically about data? Do they have the confidence to point out when data points perhaps don't reflect what they know to be true about their, about their students' learning? Are they supported by their administrations to spend less time uh, generating data points by giving tests and more time thinking, how can I teach better? Uh, is there a pedagogical explanation behind these data points? So these are the sorts of questions that I personally find really interesting and it even comes down to the language and the framing that we use. If teachers feel empowered and, and in control of, their, of the way that they interact with education data, then the opportunities for their creative and their innovative use of it really open up. So right now you hear so much, you know, what can this uh, ed tech tool do or this platform do for teachers? What if we flipped it and said, what can teachers do <laughs> with this ed tech tool and this platform? Even that sort of minor change in our language in policy can have really profound trickle down impacts because it reframes teachers as the change agents, not as the consumers consumers of these decisions that are being made by others. Thank you. Uh, I think you have a nice set of recommendations what to do with your teachers or by yourself <laughs> when you get back home. But now I would like to put focus on uh, students. Sonia, would you like to please start first? So the question is, um, we also in European school that had the research and that showed that students really rarely have opportunity to monitor their data to get personalize uh, predictions, use some dash dashboard. So how we could give students more voice, more participation and support them? So uh, it's a great question. And I think we are at the very beginning of this. I mean, mm. data is power, right? Knowledge is power. And 
I don't think there are many schools that have sought to allow children to share in knowing what data is collected about them. So, um, so this is kind of beyond the sort of the GDPR mindset, which does matter in that children do should know what that is data is held and be able to correct it um, and be able to know what is sent from this school to the next school. But beyond that, you know, I, in a way, this is within every school's um, power already. They they collect the data on the children instead of just, you know, sign these terms of use. You know, let's think about it. Let's have a lesson on it. Let's discuss it. Let's show you the back end. I, I don't know in, in other schools, but in Britain, the teacher often sits at the front of the class just entering data points on the children all day long. And never do the children get to go around and see what's, what's on that. They are dying to. You know, when I do work, workshops on data literacy with children in schools. They, this is something they want to learn more than their French verbs, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but they are really keen to learn about this data and how it works and what it's used for. And the school could be a model. The school could be a place where we show what transparency looks like. We show what um, youth voice and children being heard and matters that affect them really looks like. Um, and they, they would have some bright ideas about, you know, but we, we, we did a survey in the Digital Futures Commission and we found less than one in five children have ever had any discussion from their school about what data is collected about them or how they might correct it or what rights they might have over it. I mean, good for the one in five schools. <laughs> um, you know, maybe they're showing the way to go. But I think this is, we're just at the beginning of a very serious task in involving children and young people. Thank you. Just the beginning. Maria, this year was your passion year of youth. Yes. So, how are we supporting you to give them voice? <laughs> well, I will have to start by acknowledging that gradually students are gaining some control over some of their data. For example, during COVID when they were using e-learning platforms, they had access to dashboards, uh, giving information, for example, on the time spent on the platform, the scoring, and so on or when they access some forms, they participate in forums, they can see, uh, they can have some information about their participation in the forums. Um, or, for example, when they use language learning applications, the application gradually catches up with uh, the level of the student and provides information, so the student gets access to some data. But on the other hand, we also have to mention that if we talk about primary and secondary education, these people are underaged, which means that they need protection and they need guidance. We cannot just start giving uncritically and uh, full access to data to these people, because then we might have a uh, series of issues, including discrimination, bias, increase of bullying incidents, and so on. We need to be really careful on how and to whom we give access to data. So on the one hand, the Commission is you know, always open to be t and seeks to be transparent. On the other hand, especially if we are talking about underage people, I think we need to be very careful. That's why we need to train all the students on what data and AI in education is about through le training courses, um, I don't know, through various types of uh, trainings and learning opportunities, we need to train them about the topic, on the topic, and also develop some competencies, like not only critical thinking, which is the fashionable thing to say, I think, critical thinking, but we also need to explain to them that every action has a reaction and some consequences. So if you get access to some specific data, and for example, you share it on Instagram or Facebook, and you start acting, you know, you engage in mobbing, for example, this might lead to consequences, legal implications, or it might even lead to a suicide. So we are very skeptical on opening up data to people, especially who are uh, quite young. Um, I think we are, um, we are skeptical on this, uh, more or less. <laughs> I, I would say this was a call back to reality. <laughs> I think so, I think so. Not everything should be so open and accessible to everyone. We need to filter a little bit, and younger people do not always have the best filters. Uh, of course, uh, this can happen to every yeah. adult Everybody. person yeah. who shares his personal <laughs> life on social media, I, I, yeah. I realize that. But especially for underage, protection and guidance should be more important. Of course, we always have to have in mind 
the age of our students and who we are working with. So, Julia, did the Broadband Commission touch that area? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think in general, what UNESCO again can offer is, is zooming out to the, the global landscape because it's important to always reground our conversations in the understanding that there are massive digital divides <laughs> around, around the globe. And so when answering this question, if we're going to talk about uh, how we can get students to, to interact more with their data, um, a 2020 report from the UNESCO Institute for Statistics shows a very, very different picture when we zoom out of Europe to the international context because we're really far from uh, dashboards and learning analytics in a lot of the world. So over half of countries worldwide, 53%, still rely on paper-based information systems to inform planning and management. Two out of three countries worldwide, or 64%, don't even use student IDs to inform planning or sector, uh, sector monitoring. And almost a third of education ministries remain unable to precisely locate the schools that they're managing. So again, from the international perspective, there's, there's a long way to go um, for most children in the world to interact with their, with their data in a really meaningful way. So the fact that, uh, that learners from predominantly the global south may come in less contact with their data uh, could actually have all sorts of ripple effects. Uh, for example, it means that many of the ed tech tools that are maybe uh, given to the, to the education ministries in these countries haven't been designed with those students' data in mind. Um, and so uh, this could be even harmful for the students that are interacting with those, with those kinds of tools. But if we look then at the more advanced, uh, digitally advanced context, I think trust is a really key issue. Um, students can only be participants in the use of their data if they know how their institutions are using them. So w a study that we cite in, in the Broadband Commission report shows that students inherently trust their institutions to use their data ethically. Um, but would this still be the case if those institutions were open and transparent about how learning analytics are applied to their data? Um, and this study in particular showed that when students were educated about how their universities were using learning and predictive analytics, there was actually a big increase in uh, opting into to non-disclosure. So if we want students to be partners in how learning analytics, for example, are applied to their data, then they need to be aware of current practices and to build trust with their institutions. Hmm. Thank you, Juliet. And Stefano, OECD perspective? Well, let, let me start by saying that, in fact, uh, many students already have access to their data, you know, even if it's not digital. They know their grades, you know, they know whether they are absent or not. If they have discipline, no, they, they know about that. They know how they compare with the students in their classroom, sometimes in the school. So there is some information already that is, and you don't need actually uh, a lot of systems for that. However, what they don't have, usually speaking, is all the interesting data that Maya described, you know, because they don't have access to intelligent tutoring system in most cases, you know, in many countries. And so, or when they have, you know, these drilling systems which are so useful, sometimes they just know whether it was right or wrong. And they don't have, you know, there is no, with Usually speaking, they use more not so intelligent tutoring system, you know, dumb uh, tutoring system, so that they just tell them pass or not, and they don't give them any feedback on what they're using. So I think it's really the responsibility, if we want them to use the data, is provide them with more interesting data <laughs> and in a more uh, accessible way, in, in many ways. But let me react on one thing that you know I've heard, and, and I guess working for an economic organization, you know, the Organization <laughs> for Economic <laughs> Cooperation and <laughs> Development, on the openness of data. I think the big problem is not so much uh, uh, to whom, you know, the access, it's more for what purpose. Mm. And, you know, we need to keep in mind that in many other sectors in education, the big problem is to actually open the data so that, in fact, other companies can use them, develop new systems that are going to be much more. Uh, useful, affordable, etc. That's why we want interoperability as well, you know, uh, that's yeah. we want. And so we don't want them to use it for marketing, to put, you know, yeah. people in jail or to create some harm. But we may actually think about opening some of this data and so that they are, as you mentioned before, you know, for the betterment of education, not for other purposes. <laughs> Lots of interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> We covered only only small small portion, but unfortunately our time is running out. Mm -hmm. So uh, final words just for this panel. So um, we mentioned lots of interesting things. 
Uh, I just ask you to point one. <laughs> Um, one of the guiding principles you would like to, to stay with our audience. Juliette, please. <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. Um, international cooperation for local innovation. I, I don't like know if, to Who's elaborate on this, but um, I think one thing that, that wasn't necessarily talked about a ton during this panel is, is the importance of um, multi-stakeholder cooperation and, and involving the private sector in these conversations in order to uh, get local innovation to actually be effective and ethical. Yeah. Thank you. Stefan? Well, I agree very much with that. <laughs> uh, and, but would like also to, to emphasize, you know, the, the importance. So the last point, in addition to the international operation, to, to, to work together, you know, uh, between researchers, uh, you know, so, so civil society, teachers, governments, uh, to develop some of these tools and to, to implement them. So both in research projects, in uh, uh, bigger ones, you know, like and I think the, the model that a few countries are putting in place, like in the Netherlands, for example, you know, with their new center on kind of triple helix center on AI in education. That's an interesting model that, and that, you know, we'll see if it works, but that's really one of the way forward to me. Sonia? So I'll come back to children's rights um, and say and pick up on uh, Juliet's point about trust. I think there's a lot of dystopian talk around technology in the classroom, and I think if we had an explicit child rights framework, as the European Commission has mainstreamed through all of its work, um, then I think there would be much more confidence from children, parents, teachers, and one of the really key issues there, I would just say last, is to be confident that that in the ed tech and the data collection in our schools, children's best interests trump commercial interests. Mm. Thank you. Maria? Well, I think I will summarize the rest of the <laughs> people in the panel. I would say that we all, all stakeholders, not policymakers or teachers, or all stakeholders need to develop the competencies to be able to use data in a benevolent manner taking ethical and legal considerations into account. I sound like a definition. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is the, the, the main summary. I think I like all those definitions <laughs> I heard in, in, in last sentences. Well, let me express gratitude for having you here personally and from the European School Night. I think we all learned a lot from your different perspectives. And I also invite our audience to follow the lead and uh, take part in European school net projects like Agile Edu and our Agile Information Collections. So, not taking any other minute from your side, networking lunch 